Hello, Ride On people. Well, uh, I've had my uh, BMW R 1200 GS Adventure now for uh, coming up for, for its first year actually, and uh, it's nearly done 9,000 miles now, I think. So, I thought time for a 9k update. So, let's turn her on and see what the actual mileage is. Okay, so we're up to uh, 8590, and if I scroll through this, I've got a range of 324 miles at the moment. It's one of the things I really love about this bike. It's really, uh, that's really nice uh, to have that kind of range. And we've got 67 degrees today, which is nice, and averaging a speed of uh, nearly 45 miles an hour. And the average fuel consumption I'm getting is 42, and that's been consistent for the whole of the 8,500 miles that I've had the bike. So what's been good, bad, and indifferent? Well, let's have a walk around the bike. Let's start with the stuff I've farkled with. Okay, so let's start with the Wunderlich screen. And this lip spoiler is very easy to fit. It just has a couple of uh, bolts there. And... Uh, Pretty easy to adjust up and down, backwards and forwards, and uh, overall, quite pleased with that. Actually, it's quite effective, um, particularly at highway speeds, and particularly you know once you get above about kind of 70 miles an hour, I guess, you know that kind of 70 to 90 mile range, it just takes the 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 buffeting off the top of your crash helmet. So I like that. The thing I dislike more is sometimes it gets in the way of your vision a little bit. I have it set at a height that is kind of fairly level with my eye level uh, but it is a little bit low um, when you're in the twisty so sometimes when I'm off the major road I'll uh, lower it down to its lowest setting get a bit of airflow better vision but on the, the highway on the freeway it's great if you've got a long long kind of motorway journey to do um, highly recommended what else well we've got the uh, universal ram mount and this is a very easy ram mount to to use it's an X mount and you just twist it like that, plonk your iPhone in and uh, it works a treat actually. I've got this, this little cable here running down to the USB port and uh, that powers up the, uh, the iPhone when I've got it fitted to the bike and I can run Waze along with my GPS so that uh, I've got a kind of double reference if you like in terms of uh, navigation. I can have the bespoke map on my uh, Garmin GPS um, when I say bespoke map, I mean uh, program map um, via base camp on my Garmin GPS and then I can just have the destination in here in terms of ways and that will help me out in terms of, uh, you know, if there's a hazard ahead like, you know, broken down car or police or, um, you know, um, congestion and, and I need to reroute the, the route. Okay, the highway pegs. I've had the highway pegs on a little while now. These are real quality items. They have a, uh, a screw off end where you can kind of shove in emergency money or matches and stuff like that. And uh, they look okay and they're very, very grippy. This is a, this is a highly, I don't know what will come out on the camera, but it's a highly machined surface and uh, it's a really, um, really kind of grippy surface for your foot. Uh, I do find that uh, it helps sometimes on the, on the freeway just to be able to stretch out the leg and uh, kind of moves the weight off your backside uh, in one position to a different position. That helps the airflow and the blood flow rather and um, that helps uh, alleviate kind of hot spots. Um, but it's not exactly a natural position. It's not like a kind of kicked out um, cruiser uh, position for the pegs and um, unfortunately um, it's not easy to relocate them anywhere else and I would say probably not worth the money but kind of worth it in terms of the build quality is very high and it can always be taken off and used on another bike or sold at some point. This is the uh, Wunderlich uh, GoPro mount and it's quite expensive it's over a hundred bucks and I don't like this adjuster on the back this plastic adjuster it's very flimsy had a few problems with it and really I don't think um, it's worth the money I would give that a miss personally. This little beauty uh, for the front GoPro mount was bought off Amazon I think it's a kind of Chinese 
rip off of the Wunderlich type thing, but it's extremely high quality. I cannot believe the quality of this thing, and it was only about 14 bucks, literally. So, uh, you know, normally I'll buy, you know, close to the top of the range with the most expensive stuff I can and everything under the premise that, you know, you might have paid through the nose slightly, but it'll work. But in terms of these GPS clamps, or GoPro clamps, I should say, um, couldn't be more wrong really uh, this is clearly over a hundred dollars cheaper than the Wunderlich one and it just works out the crate now I added these Brooks panniers they may look like Tura Tech but they're made by Brooks and uh, I also added this adventure uh, illum illuminating kind of sticker kit um, or reflective sticker kit I should say and I'd be very very pleased with the Brooks panniers they are a solid bit of kit and uh, literally half the price of the BMW stroke Touratech versions so money well spent I just want to show you the inside of the uh, pannier and I lined this with cheap felt uh, felt sticky backing that I got from Amazon that's been great it's not compressed at all it's not damaged or uh, dirty or kind of uh, you know compressed in any areas and it's enabled me to carry cameras and God knows what without them getting damaged in there. The only slight pain with these uh, panniers is that I found these wheels and the uh, locking nuts sometimes come a bit loose. So I, I tend to check them just as a uh, every time I feel them basically and every time I ride them. Um, it's not really a big problem but if you end up doing some gravel roads, you end up doing a fire trail for 20 miles or something it's shaking about and stuff, just the vibration can loosen them off. Now I could get them tighter simply by using a, a wrench, using a spanner on here to tighten it up tight but I just like doing it finger tight. You, you know that you're never going to kind of strip the thread or have a problem then and generally just doing it up finger tight is more than sufficient. It's uh, it's uh, kind of compared with the BMW which has an external lock it seems to be a bit of a faff but equally it's a very good security measure because nobody can get at that lock and uh, damage it so you know it's, it's very securely mounted to the bike. So what about the general fit and finish? Well as you can see I'm not adverse to uh, getting the bike dirty and wet and riding out in the rain and riding on gravel roads that are dusty and you know this bike gets used it's not it's not overly pampered it's not cleaned and polished every single week uh, it actually uh, ends up doing anywhere between two to three hundred miles a week um, I don't commute on the bike uh, don't tend to ride it after dark so you know eight and a half thousand miles in about ten months uh, is done purely on kind of Saturday stroke Sunday riding and uh, this thing gets used and it is good it's, I can't find any signs of corrosion or tarnishing um, when I do clean it I do, too, tend to clean it um, pretty immaculately and there's no corrosion on the exhaust there's no problems with the spokes um, all the shaft drive looks very very clean when cleaned up uh, no problems with the springs or suspension and uh, the overall fit and finish is just you know BMW just got it right now and quite rightly you know if these bikes are expensive and um, you know BMW leads the market clearly in the adventure bike scene and this bike is the most important bike in the entire BMW range uh, I know some people may disagree with that but it just is in terms of sales it decimates everything else they sell it's globally the number one big selling big bike and uh, for good reason so uh, I'm just emphasizing that not because I, I bought it I'm not patting myself on the back or anything I'm just saying that it's far too important for BMW to mess mess up basically and that's why um, it's extremely well built I do like the lights on this uh, the daytime running lights the spotlights it gives a really good broad spread of light and uh, I really like um, I don't tend to ride this bike after dark very much but when I do very very pleased it's like you know driving in the car it really does illuminate totally unlit lanes extremely well let's talk about the tires briefly 
These are Michelin Pilot Road 4 trial tyres. Um, they replaced the Anarchy Michelins at 6,000 miles. I had them replaced front and rear. There was some life left in the front, but the rear is shot, was shot. And it's a 6,000 mile service, so it just made sense to swap them both at the same time. In fact, Jerry, my friend with the GS Adventure, he also does that as well. And um, I decided to switch to these based on uh, some reviews by people like uh, Fort9, um, who basically just said, you know, in terms of adventure bikes, um, you know, in terms of uh, all round good tyres, you're very much going to struggle to beat these in terms of a kind of sport touring type tyre for an adventure bike. And I think it's been uh, very true. When they were very new, they seem to steer a little bit quicker than the Anarchies. I think on reflection, it's, it's fairly similar. Um, but what is really good about these tyres is the wet weather performance. They are exceptionally good. They have a lot of sipes, as you can see, or, or slits in the tyres. And that is very, very good at shifting water quickly out the way. And they give significantly more confidence, I felt, than the original uh, Anarchies, which I liked. It was a good tyre, I didn't have an issue with them. But in terms of um, wet weather use, very, very, very pleased with these tyres. And they warm up quickly. I've ridden uh, in sub-zero temperatures with these where, you know, we've got ice coming, cascading down the hillsides from little waterfalls and stuff. And felt totally at, uh, at one with the tyres, totally gripping, no traction control cutting in issues or anything like that. So the seat height, um, those familiar with my initial impressions video of this bike, uh, I went for a low seat height and I'm kind of six foot two-ish, so I didn't really need to technically, but this bike uh, in the um, triple black had everything I wanted and uh, it just happened to be fitted with the low seat, which I got on with okay. Um, on reflection, I think I would probably prefer the standard seat in terms of kind of leg room but equally sometimes it's very handy when you've got to paddle it around and you know you're that bit closer to the ground etc. Um, I would like to kind of uh, have a little bit more leg room. I sometimes find my feet kind of poking down and sometimes scraping the edge of my boots around corners although the pegs never seem to touch down. So. Uh, I, I think in, in general it's, it's been kind of fine and if I was buying again I don't know maybe I'd go for the standard seat but no problem with the lower seat either really to be honest with you. The handguards are pretty uh, pretty average to be honest they don't they're not particularly wide there are aftermarket ones available which will uh, extend you know that a little bit higher um, people like uh, the Mizzleton Flyer, for instance, has done uh, a good review on ones he had fitted to his GS. I checked those out if uh, if you have a GS and uh, you don't think they're particularly good. I think, you know, it's kind of nicer than not having them on a cold day or whatever, but when it's really cold and you've got the heated grips on, sometimes there's a lot of airflow getting around the sides here and chilling your uh, little fingers, so not the greatest. In terms of the main screen itself, you know, kind of ignoring the Wunderlich lip, you know, it's pretty broad, it's a good shape, it does adjust quite tall, and uh, I really have no complaints. When it's really, really cold out, it really pushes the cold air away from your, your torso and helps keep you warm, and it also keeps the rain off you if you get caught out in a, in a rain shower. So, pretty good, at all things considered. The mirrors on the bike are really very good. Um, I don't really have any problems, I don't really have to kind of always be bending in my elbows in order to see behind me. Uh, they're not uh, a particularly ugly shape, they kind of look a bit like a, an early millennium Ducati shaped mirror really. They've got a little bit of style for, uh, for the Germans and uh, they just work and they, uh, you know, they're vibration free so I've got no issues or concerns there. In terms of the switch gear, I don't actually use the uh, scroll controller uh, with the uh, GPS because you have to buy the BMW Garmin version which is like $1,000 or something ridiculous, totally overpriced. I have a, a regular Garmin, uh, it will fit in the cradle, it will power up, it will work, it just will not uh, work from the toggle switch. So 
you know, uh, with the new TFT screens, uh, they work from the toggle switch, as does the BMW version of the Garmin. I just don't have that, and uh, I can, uh, I'd prefer to save a $1,000 than uh, change my Garmin. And if I was changing my Garmin, I'd probably go for the new TomTom -tom that's uh, not been released yet. So if you're thinking about buying a new GPS, check that out first. In terms of the general switch gear, I mean, I think BMW just knock it out of the ballpark. Some of the uh, European bikes, sometimes you you feel the switch gear and there's you know loads and loads of travel and playing it. They, it feels like it's really plasticky and nasty. These things feel really solid, you know, really chunky, like a, a decent quality car. There's a little bit of flex in the um, indicator one, I think, but in terms of everything else, you know, the switch gear is very solid, very chunky, and I really do do like that. And I like the grips, which are quite thin and quite grippy and uh, have a nice feel to them. The um, levers themselves work very well. Clutch is slightly heavy on this bike. I've never ever noticed it. I've never noticed it being a problem, but then I've ridden a couple of other bikes and just happened to notice that it's a little bit, bit lighter on some of the other bikes. Uh, the rear rack is uh, very practical on this. I don't have a top case, but I often strap a, a waterproof bag to this and there's plenty of places to hook your bung bungee cords. And um, this handle's pretty good for pillions, although I'd say, um, you know, there could be some kind of covering on here which would be kind of grippier and warmer to touch. And it could also be raised up a little bit higher. There's not the greatest amount of uh, room between the pillions uh, hand and the, and the cases. So comfort then for both the, uh, the pillion and also the rider. I mean, these seats are great in, in the main. They do take a bit of uh, wearing in and um, I wouldn't say it was the most comfortable for the first thousand miles, but I think after that, both your body gets used to the shape and the, the um, foam inside starts to break down a little bit in favor of your body shape. And overall, they work really well. I think if I keep the bike another couple of years, I'll probably spring for a Corbin saddle uh, just to ensure that I've got more comfort on the really long days, you know, kind of 400 mile days rather than 200, 250, which this breeze is. And I have to say that generalizing, quite often I'll ride, you know, 70 miles between hops and it's not really a problem. By then you're kind of ready for a bit of a leg stretch anyway, irrelevant what bike you're riding, I think. And you only really need five, 10 minutes off this thing to get the blood flowing and then you can hop back on it. And of course, one of the beauties of this bike is it is designed to run off-road um, in a in a gentle way like a like a Range Rover kind of way and so that it's designed to let the rider stand up and that really helps in terms of uh, blood flow you know when you've got uh, you don't want to stop yeah you're, you're running late or you, you can't stop you know maybe you're on the type of road where it's just there's nowhere to pull over you can carry on riding really up to kind of 70 miles an hour not that I'm recommending it but uh, I feel comfortable doing it standing up uh, up to those kind of speeds and uh, you're again you're only going to stand up for a couple of minutes or, or, or you know often 30 seconds or so and it's enough to get the blood flowing and then when you sit down um, you feel much more comfortable again. Standard crash bars are very very good fortunately I've not had to test those not had the bike fall over or anywhere near that not had any issues. These little winglets work pretty well. Uh, they're totally non-adjustable, but they do help uh, deflect the wind away a little bit. I like the shape of these turn signals or indicators as we, we call them in the UK. And they're very, uh, they're very uh, bright and uh, they've got a fair amount of flex in them. I think if you accidentally bash them uh, you know, against branches or something like that, you're not gonna have any issues, concerns. And I know there's a bit of a trend for small turn signals, but I actually uh, like large turn signals as long as they're a fairly nice shape like these are, just because I like the idea of uh, being seen by cars when I'm turning. One nice little thing on the uh, GS Adventure is this little storage area. And in here I've got a, I've got a combination helmet lock, some uh, cables that I can run through, a helmet chin bar, I've got my insurance details, I've got some emergency cash, and this has a nice waterproof seal around it, and it's just a nice little kind of cubby hole storage area that you can just 
put a couple of things in and uh, it's nice and secure. I do know some people that will put the emergency key in those or their actual key rather than keep it in their pocket. But I like to keep uh, essentials like my money and uh, the keys to the bike physically on my person so that I don't uh, leave the bike uh, with them on accidentally. So after 8,500 or so miles, am I pleased with the bike? Uh, did I make the right decision? I think absolutely yeah, I, I did make the right decision. My last bike, the Ducati Monster 1200R, was a stonking bike, lots of fun. Um, but I think sometimes you get a bit carried away with the image and performance of a machine and you forget the practicalities of what you actually use it for. And for me, I was uh, riding bigger and bigger distances, you know, all day riding rather than just you know, around the block or on a track day or just, you know, 50 mile hop somewhere in that. I was going out for the day for 250 miles and, you know, the weather changes uh, uh, greatly in Georgia in terms of temperature fluctuation. We, we can, I think uh, last Saturday went out and the weather at the start of the ride and the end of the ride was 30 degrees warmer. And that's, that's a big shift. So it really helps if you can carry stuff, is what I'm saying. And uh, I had a complete change of clothes, really, from kind of full-on winter uh, suit with, uh, you know, um, sweatshirt on underneath. And I was able to change out of all of that and have an airflow jacket by the end of the day. So that kind of uh, real-world practicality is great. As is uh, things that you begin to very quickly take for granted, like a massive tank range of up to 350 miles and a seat that is uh, all day comfortable for two people in the main. And great weather protection as well. And uh, some lovely standard features, you know, apart from the fact of the, the fully loaded safety features such as, you know, um, cornering ABS and traction control. Uh, obviously we have electronic suspension and we have cruise control and, um, you know, digital, um, not a TFT on my particular bike, um, but uh, you know, we have digital displays giving nice uh, information like tyre pressures, for instance, and stuff. And um, you know, the heated grips have been a godsend as I've been riding every weekend throughout winter. And uh, overall, um, you know, I can't really fault it. I, there's nothing I would really change about the bike uh, other than maybe trying to Corbin saddle at some point if. Uh, I wanted to keep it longer or wanted to do some, you know, proper touring holiday on it. And um, all things considered, um, I still think it's the best all round motorcycle ever made. Um, and I've owned 33 bikes, probably ridden in excess of 300 bikes now. So um, I speak with a fair degree of experience when I, when I say that. I really genuinely believe it's, it's that good. It, and it's my third GS. I had a 1150, an early 1200, and now the GS Adventure. I actually like the GS Adventure the best. Not surprisingly, it's kind of the, the, you know the newest. But having said that, um, I think it strangely, despite being the heaviest, um, actually handles the best, and um, it's just so big and comfortable and uh, practical. It's very, very hard to think what you would replace it with. If I was replacing it uh, for another adventure bike, I'd just buy the same thing again with TFT screens. I don't think the price difference to upgrade would probably be worth it at present. Um, but if I didn't have a GS Adventure already, I think that's what I would probably go for. Uh, so all things considered, uh, it's not my camera is dying, so I'm sorry if the, uh, the lighting isn't uh, too good in this this bit, so I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, if you're thinking about buying a GS Adventure and you don't have one, I wholeheartedly recommend it, do it. I can't guarantee I'm gonna keep this bike forever, but in terms of GS Adventure versus the current competition, uh, I think uh, all things considered, if you want the easiest bike in the world to live with, this is it. Sorry about the camera dying. Uh, don't forget to ride often. Ride safely, ride on.